Uh, welcome to the last lecture in the series entitled Psychology of Religion with Dr. Ralph Hood, International Scholar. We're privileged to have with us again today a special guest, Dr. Hood, from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. We enjoyed an excellent lecture yesterday on spirituality and religiousness. And today will also be a provocative presentation on mysticism. Although Dr. Hood is internationally renowned as a scholar and as an expert in many areas of the psychology of religion, mysticism is a topic on which he is arguably the foremost authority in the world. Dr. Hood has authored or co-authored some 12 books, not including his uh, textbook, The Psychology of Religion, which has gone through four editions and on its way to a fifth to become the most widely used textbook in American colleges and universities on the topic. He has authored, co-authored well over 250 book chapters, encyclopedia entries, journal articles, and reviews. He is past editor of the premier journal for the scientific study of religion and co-founding editor of the International Journal for the Psychology of Religion. He is past president of the American Psychological Association, Division 36, which is the Society for the Psychology of Religion and Spirituality. And from that division is a recipient of the William James Award and the Distinguished Service Award. He's lectured all over the world, certainly not only over all of North America, but in Asia, the Middle East, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, as well as Northern Africa. And we're indeed privileged to have Dr. Hood on campus at Henderson State University for these lectures. So would you please help me welcome to the podium Dr. Ralph Hood. Thank you, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. And I thought about what I would talk about today. And while I had one PowerPoint presentation, I'm not going to deliver that. I thought I would focus upon um, the fact that today is Good Friday. And that's an interesting um, observation. Because for some, they take the events that are referenced uh, literally, historically. For others, metaphorically. For others, symbolically. And for some, they simply don't care. But what's interesting about Good Friday is it references what is clearly the most significant empirical study done in the psychology of religion. And I want to take this opportunity to uh, present a thesis and build it up and end it with data that is derived from what is called the Good Friday Experiment. And in order to do that, um, I want to start with a slight dilemma. Um, the APA has recently published a two-volume handbook of the psychology of religion. And that handbook, edited by a good friend of mine, Ken Parkman, um, covers the entire range and scope of the psychology of religion, which has just reemerged as a significant object of study for psychologists, particularly American psychologists. And in that handbook, I wrote two of the chapters. One, I wrote the chapter on mysticism, which obviously will be aside for right now. But more importantly, I think, is I wrote the chapter on research methodology. And what I want to do is bring back uh, a research focus that had been, I think, too narrowly defined in contemporary psychology particularly contemporary American psychology. So I went back and revised something that was first proposed by James Dittes at Yale University. When he said, if we take the psychology of religion seriously, we have four options methodologically. One, it may be that the variables that psychologists of religion study are just like the variables that any psychologist studies in any area of interest. 
So if you want to study religious beliefs, well then you're studying beliefs. They just have to be religious beliefs, but they shouldn't function or operate any differently than political beliefs or any other kind of beliefs. Or it may be that the variables in psychology of religion is a second option, or the same as in psychology generally, but they're more salient, they're more important. So religious beliefs might function like other beliefs, but they're just um, more important, more salient than other beliefs. I'm reminded what they, they say in Alabama. They always remind me of my good friends who are football uh, aficionados that, um, that football in Alabama is not religion. It's much more important than that. So you, you have the sense of, of a series of variables but the psychology of religion would be nothing unique. But there are two other options, and those are the options I want to build a bridge to today. And that is, it may be that the psychology of religion has unique religious variables that interact with psychological variables. And so that interaction adds something that you couldn't get by focusing upon psychology simply within the confines of a natural science. And the fourth option, which I'm just going to briefly mention and let set, let set aside for most of this lecture, is there may be unique variables that operate in religion that operate nowhere else. So in order to draw this thread to a position that I want to defend today, which I'm going to call, uh, in my language, the common core, thesis in mysticism. I want to start where the psychology of religion actually starts in America, and it's with William James. And William James is the kind of psychologist that even psychologists who like him love to hate. He was twice president of the American Psychological Association, but also to the chagrin of empirically oriented uh, psychologists was a continual member of the Society for the Study of Psychical Research. And he wrote the two undisputed classics in the history of psychology. And the first was a profoundly significant work called The Principles of Psychology. It was 10 years in the making, a thousand pages, and a brilliant effort to establish the discipline of psychology by treating it as if it were a natural science. So what William James did was write a psychology that refused to confront issues, for instance, of the soul, by saying we will advance psychology the same way they advance physics, the same way they advance chemistry. We will treat psychology as a natural science. And he did that. And when he got done, there were people amazingly critical of the principles. Everyone recognized it to be a work of a genius, but people were disturbed by the extensive metaphysical, philosophical discussions that William James had to enter into to defend the basic natural science data of psychology. So his publisher did the first thing that started what I call the dumbing down of psychology text. They, students at Harvard would not read a thousand page book. So they asked William James to carve it down and to take only the data part and forget the philosophical discussions of options and, and possibilities and only give the basic data. And that book then got rid of 70% of the principles. And it was called Psychology the Briefer Course or as William James' students called it, the Jimmy. And that book, when James got done, drove James out of psychology. And I have one quote I'm going to read you from William James, because he said, the psychology of the natural science approach could only be invented in Germany in a culture where no one could get bored. Because he said, the facts that he could talk about were of little interest to people truly interested 
in psychology, especially psychology that interface with those other options that I suggested to you, interacting with religious variables that do not have a place within the natural science of psychology. So here's what he said at the end of the little brief report. At present, psychology is in the condition of physics before Galileo and the laws of motion, of chemistry before Lavoisier and the notion that mass is preserved in all reaction. The Galileo and the Lavoisier of psychology will be famous persons indeed when they come, as come they someday surely will, or past success is no index to the future. When they do come, however, the necessity of the case will make them metaphysical. Meanwhile, the best way in which we can facilitate their advent is to understand how great is the darkness in which we grow, and never to forget that the natural science assumptions with which we started are provisional and reversible things. So the standard histories of psychology claim that James then left psychology and spent the rest of his life, the rest of his life, pondering philosophical and even theological, metaphysical issues. That's not correct. What he did is he was invited to deliver the Gifford Lectures in Scotland. And it was an amazing um, achievement for an American scientist. Because before William James, all of the scientists came from Europe to America to lecture. And uh, what some people think is the founder of the experimental psychology boom was invited to come to America. But Americans were never invited go to Europe, but James was. And the Gifford lectures that he was to deliver was to focus upon what became a classic, again, the other classic that William James produced, the varieties of religious experience. And the variety of religious experience is an amazing book because it's subtitled A Study in Human Nature. So the procedure that James gave was to abandon natural science assumptions and instead to produce what some people call a proto-phenomenological work. But a, a simpler way to express that is a work that took seriously the report of individuals focusing upon their religious experiences in the world. Now, if we went in this direction, we would almost have to stop this lecture. Because what is of amazing interest is a move that William James made. It's been said by Gorsuch and Miller and other people that if William James were writing the book today, delivering that series of lectures, it would be titled Varieties of Spiritual, Not Religious Experiences. And there's a reason for that. James was the first to write a book on religious experience, ignoring religion. And he did that because he could make a distinction that's hotly debated in the literature today, and a distinction that I'm going to def definitively stand on one side. So let me first give you the distinction, and then raise the criticism to that distinction, and then give a slight rebuttal to those criticisms so I can take us toward the Good Friday experiment. James said that we are going to make a distinction between experience and the interpretation of experience. So James says, if I talk to you about religion, right, we're going to argue forever. You recognize two people with differing religious convictions sit down and you get at least three opinions. And you can't resolve it. So James said, instead of talking about how people interpret their experience, let's look at what that interpretation, that language, is pointing towards. So take any religious text. Read the prophets. Read the, the book of, of Revelation, if you're out of a Christian tradition. Read the Quran And ask yourself one thing in a Jamesian fashion. What kind 
of experiences are articulated in that kind of language. And it raises a interesting defense of the subtitle of James's book, which is a study in human nature. Because James wants to argue, and I want to argue the same a bit later, that individuals who have different interpretations can nevertheless share the same experience. So we want to focus more closely on the experience and leave as a secondary issue what people think or how people interpret that experience. Now the criticisms that are raised, all of you in modern psychology know immediately. The best criticism probably has raged for 20 years by those followers of Katz, who has written a whole series of books, right now three volumes going on to a fourth, in which he argues in the summary statement he makes, there are no unmediated experiences. And therefore, every experience that you have is culturally embedded, linguistically embedded, and therefore there's no possibility of somebody out of an Islamic tradition articulating their mysticism, which we'll get to in a second, in the dialogue with Christian uh, articulating their mystical experience, because each one brings to it the tradition of Islam, the tradition of Christianity, and a particular kind of interpretation that necessarily makes the experiences different. However, William James doesn't think so. So let me do one more quote from William James that comes from the varieties of religious experience. And as he developed the lectures in that book, he got to the two key lectures, the two key chapters in the varieties. And those chapters are on mystical experience, simply titled mysticism. And here's what James first said. Mysticism is the root and center of all religion of all great faith traditions. The reason religious discourse exists is because it tries to encode and to make <coughs> comprehensible an experience that is universal and widely shared among all humanity. And if you ask him, what is that experience? Here's what he would say first and foremost. He said, the irony is that two hallmarks of mystical experience are the following. The first, it's noetic. It's an experience that is absolutely authoritative for the person who has it. It's immediate, non-reflexive, and self-authenticated. So if somebody said to you they had this great breakthrough insight into the nature of reality, the world, this experience, the next thing you would typically say is, okay, tell me. But here's where William James produces a delightful dilemma. He says, the knowledge that you obtain through mystical experience is ineffable. Meaning by ineffability, not that it's difficult to describe, not by the fact that it's difficult to put into words, not the fact that it's a secret, but the fact language cannot apply to it. So the irony is, James, taking from the principles, develops a distinction of ways of knowing. And one way of knowing, and it's a perfectly valid way of knowing, is to have knowledge about something. And knowledge about something is linguistically encoded and embedded. And it means there is a distinction between the knower and the object known. But the other kind of knowledge is knowledge of. And the only way you can have knowledge of is to experience it. So for instance, if you've never tasted a lemon, there's nothing I can do to describe to you what that taste is like, except to make an effort. Have you ever tasted a lime? And if you say that, yes, well, it's something like that, but. Have you ever tasted an orange? Yes, well, it's something like that, but. But ultimately, the way you know what a lime tastes like is you must taste the line. You must experience it. So James says that the root of religion 
is a certain kind of experience. And people who have that experience and attend to it are susceptible to seeking out religious discourse that embeds that and protects it and makes it meaningful, but only because there's the experience within which one can understand what the language is pointing to. So here's the quote from William James's Varieties I'm going to give you. And I'm going to give you a name to it that William James didn't give it. And I'm going to call it the Common Core Thesis. And the Common Core Thesis is most philosophically associated with William James, more recently with Walter Stace, and then in psychology, empirically, with those people who utilize my measures of mysticism and follow in this measurement tradition. And what I'm going to start with in this part of the lecture is what's least interesting, measurement. And those of you who take courses and test measurement know what pain it can be. But I want to use measurement as a very important tool, as a bridge. So I want to tell you what I want to make a bridge to. It's to levels one and two of these variables in psychology. Religious variables can be approached psychologically as any other variables. But I want to bridge to levels three and four, where psychology links to other disciplines and other discourses that psychology cannot confront unless it allows those kind of interactions. And I need a bridge, and the bridge I'm going to use is measurement, but I'm going to get out of it rather quickly. So let's first go to the quote that William James has that will give you the gist of what I want to say. Here's the quote. In Hinduism, in Neoplatonism, in Sufism, in Christian mysticism, in Whitmanism, we find the same recurring note, so that there is about mystical utterances an eternal unanimity, which ought to make a critic stop and think, and which brings it about that the mystical classics have as has been said, neither birthday nor native land, perpetually telling of the unity of man with God, their speech antedates language, and they do not grow old. So James is arguing that this noetic ineffable experience, this experience that has a unique characteristic, is found within all of the great faith traditions and is fundamentally the same. But notice I make a distinction that for those of you who uh, follow the, the modern uh, trends in social psychology, that, that stands apart from what we might call social constructions. That notion that culture and language is a major determinant of the way you experience <coughs> the world. And I argue it is at one level, but it's not a determinant of anything dealing with mysticism. What mystical experience is, is something that stands apart from culture, apart from language. And what language does, and what culture does, is give a mode to try to express that experience, not to determine it. So the struggle that people of faith traditions have is how to make sense out of this telling profound experience for which the great faith tradition assure you there is ontological validity. So how can we go about doing that? So what I thought I would do is give you one description, and one description only of a mystical experience. And the reason I want to give it to you is I want to see if it resonates with you. And if it doesn't resonate with you, you just go, that's it. But if it does, right, then we can go somewhere. Because I'm going to focus on what I consider to be, and my M scale, which we'll talk about only briefly, can assess, is an experience in which the reason the experience is ineffable is there's a loss of the sense of self, the sense of ego, as it merges and dissolves into something of the same type but more, a unity with a consciousness that transcends that restricted individual consciousness that we identify as the empirical self. 
The language that is used often is theological, a unity with God, an awareness of God, but it need not be theological. It just means, in William James's sense, I am linked to something more, to a larger consciousness, in which I can decenter myself and rest assured in ontological terms of its wonder and meaning. So here's the experience. It's by a poet, John Simmons. I think uh, a secular poet, because this experience is described in William James's writings. It's used in one of the measures I've constructed, the religious experience episode measure, which we won't talk about. It's used by David Wolf, who doesn't like my research, but thinks this is the key experience. And we'll get back to his comment in a second, because it correlates very strongly with my mysticism scale to a magnitude of 0.8, so that this experience taps into what my scale is an indicator of, and here's the experience. I would suddenly feel the mood coming when I was at church or with people or reading, but only when my muscles were relaxed. It would irresistibly take over my mind and will last seemed what like forever and disappear in a way that resembled waking up from anesthesia. One reason that I disliked this kind of trance was that I could not describe it to myself. Even now, I can't find the right words. It involved, and here's the key part, the disappearance of space, time, feeling, and the things I call myself. As ordinary consciousness disappeared, the sense of underlying or essential consciousness grew stronger. At last, nothing remained but pure, absolute, abstract self. So these kind of experiences, widely reported in the great literatures, mystical literatures of faith tradition, can be assessed psychologically by just two assumptions. One, if James' assumption is right, that these experiences are part and parcel of human nature. But if the natural science assumption of psychology is too narrowly focused, they've been identified cross culturally and historically but with psychopathology. So in 1976, the American Psychiatric Association uh, simply declared the loss of self experienced in mystical experiences to be pathological. So people who had these kind of experiences would often be silent about them, would not talk to psychiatrists, if would not talk to priests or imams or rabbis, because they were struggling with something that was not effectively culturally embedded until two things happened. Philosopher Stace, who's a brilliant philosopher, out of a very um, rational linguistic tradition, did something that was profound. He, he took an assumption um, that was in William James that the experience of loss of self, the awareness of being merged greater reality of which you are somehow united ought to be historically identifiable in all of the great traditions. So he did something that the modern positive psychologists have done. Um, the positive psychologists have tried to focus upon not pathology, but virtues. Uh, and the positive psychologists have argued that one of the virtues that's found explicitly in all of the great faith traditions and implicitly in the two other traditions that the positive psychologists have, <coughs> which is Confucianism and Taoism, neither of which could properly be called a religion. All of them value an experience of transcendence, a mystical experience. So in the Abrahamic faith, right, in Judaism, in Christianity, and in Islam, you have the great mystical traditions. And in the Eastern traditions, in Hinduism and Buddhism, you have the great mystical traditions. And what I mean by a mystical tradition is an effort to take one's theological and religious frame of reference and understand, right, in experience, understand its theology as embedded in an experience. Empirical experience 
of the sense of loss that affirms the linguistic tradition that one happens to be culturally embedded in. So here's what Stace did. He went to all of these traditions, called the religious text, and pulled out what he called a universal core. And that universal core contains what I've already talked about, this experience of unity that is timeless and spaceless, a sense of unity in the world that is one with your subjectivity, and a series of minor, what I call facets, uh, that, that it's approached as an experience that is meaningful in a way, sacred, all of that stuff. I took Stace's phenomenology and constructed the mysticism scale. Now, the mysticism scale is important only in my sense, not as a measure of some phenomena that the scale uh, adequately uh, indexes, but rather as an indicator of the phenomena that psychologists have too long ignored. So here's what I've done. I construct my scale, and all of the traditions that have been mentioned the scale has been translated into, administered, and shown to have, for lack of uh, better language right now, um, a similar factor structure. So for those of you who are taking test measures, right, I can give my scale, translate it to um, the appropriate language, for instance, for Muslims in Iran, that translated do a confirmative factor analysis and get the same structure. I give it to Jews, appropriately translated for Jews in Israel, that translated, analyze it, get the same factor structure. Christians in America, Hindus in India, okay? The same factor structure. Buddhists in Tibet, the same factor structure. So here's what I can do. I can reliably demonstrate that I can find people who, on my measure, come out high on the report of mystical experience. But I do two things, and it's important to keep these two things in mind. I only argue that I can assess the report of mystical experience. I never claim that I actually have assessed mystical experience, because people can report experiences that they don't have, or they cannot report experiences that they do have. But what I can demonstrate cross-culturally for the Common Core thesis is I can definitely find these people everywhere in these major traditions that I've mentioned. And then what you can do is you can begin to empirically study them. So now let's take that assumption. Forget about the, the scale. If you can punch it up on the internet or email me and I'll send you the scales. And, and there's many versions, but let's just look at what psychologists can do with that. So I want to just do two things because I want to get to the Good Friday experiment. What I want to do first is tell you three simple empirical facts from over 20 years of empirical studies with the M-scale. First is mysticism is common. It's not pathological. It's reported in all of the great faith traditions, and we can study its empirical antecedents and its empirical consequences. So the fact, is there such a thing as mysticism, and can we assess the report of it? The answer is yes. The second thing is, what does it have to do necessarily with religion in the sense of faith traditions? And here, I want to go to something that's important. Psychologists are, are fond of taking huge masses of data that has reached a particular consensual conclusion and then simply abandoning them and ignoring them as new research strategies come into play. But one of the things that was a key factor in the establishment of the empirical measurement-based discipline of the psychology of religion was the work of Gordon Allport. And Gordon Allport was a psychologist uh, of religion before there was the new psychology of religion. He was at Harvard University. 
And he was interested in a puzzling problem. And the problem he was interested in was prejudice. And the problem he had is he was a good Methodist. And he said, what we ought to do is recognize that people who are believers in Methodism, who are good Protestant um, religious people, should be the least religious people, uh, the least prejudiced people, we'll get to Freud later, the least <laughs> prejudiced people, right, of anyone in the United States. But then he was also a good empirical scientist. So when he assessed the relationship of religion to prejudice, he was dumbfounded. Because it turns out that the most bigoted people in the United States focusing upon, in his case, ethnic prejudice, were people who were church attenders. And Alpert was just distraught. But he knew, he knew what to do. And this is what I tell my students. Whenever you get empirical data that doesn't match your theory, right, don't change your theory. Mess with the data, okay? Now, and that's what he did. He said, okay, the major way we assess people's religious beliefs do attend church, synagogue, mosque. He's mainly looking at Christians, so do you attend church? And he said, he came up with great insight. People attend church for all kinds of reasons. So he said, it's not whether you attend church, it's what's your motivation for attending church. And he had worked with all poor Vernon on scales of values. So he said, let's make a measure of the motivation that people have for going to church. And he said there's two basic motivations you can have, and it works for anything. And I'll make it real short. One, you can do something for extrinsic reasons. I teach at a university um, that's largely first-generation college students. And I know why they're in college. Not because they're dying to find truth, justice, and beauty, right? but because like, they want a degree and a better job. So many people go to college because they're trying to advance their education to get a better job so they can be unemployed at a higher level, right? <laughs> now, but what's good about that is that's, that's it, right? There's nothing wrong with it. But there's another group of people that are interested in it. They don't want to do X in order to get Y, right? They just want to do X because they love X. So there's two kinds of people who go to church. Two kinds of people who go to mosques. People that go because they believe intrinsically and devoutly, and that's why there's nothing else, are people who go extrinsically. Because, for instance, many uh, people in the, and we know the literature on the conversion research, um, when they get children, want their children to go to a Christian Bible camp because there's less jobs there. Right? And that's okay, but that's an extrinsic reason. You're a businessman, you want to go to church to make this contact. When you break out the people who are religious for extrinsic reasons, who are 90% of the people who are religious, they're extremely prejudiced. But when you break out people who are religious for intrinsic reasons, 10%, they have the lowest prejudice of any rate, of any group of people in the United States. So people in all persons who are religious because they live and internalize their religion are not prejudiced. And people who are religious for other reasons are the kind of people that give religion its bad name. So here's what I do. I want to get into the Good Friday experiment in just three steps. Here's the first step. We relate people's report of mystical experience to not the content of their religious belief, but to the motivation for being religious. So I can give my scales to Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, but they also have a way to assess the Alport's measures, whether their motivation is extrinsic or intrinsic. And here's what we find. And there's, I'm summarizing now, 75 studies in a real short one phrase. People who are extrinsic have the lowest rates of mystical experience, not only relative to religious people, but to other groups of people. And that's why there are people who, in the world, Simply so don't attend to mystical type experiences, may not have such types of experiences, and they're telling the truth. But intrinsic people score exceptionally high. 
And it doesn't matter if you're a follower of Islam, or if you're a follower of Christ, or you're a follower of Judaism. It doesn't make any difference because you recognize that same experience that's embedded within your tradition and is part of the living force that keeps you in your faith tradition. But the race is a problem. And here's the problem that we're going to get to when we get to the Good Friday study. Allport scale raises a problem that all psychologists have with self-report measures. It's not that self-report measures aren't important. In fact, there are many things that could only be achieved by self-report measures. But what is important is that people can lie. So how do you know? So Alport said there are some people, when you give them a scale asking about religious things, he said there are some people that he called indiscriminately pro. Like, religion is a good thing, out for religion, yes, 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 yes. They don't make distinctions. And that's okay, because there are other people that are indiscriminately anti, the new, you know, doctrine kind of atheists that has to do with religion, anything to do with religion is bad, 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 so he's for it love. So when you give the report of history experience to people that are in these four categories now, either intrinsically religious, indiscriminately pro-religious, extrinsically religious, or indiscriminately anti-religious, here's what you find. The intrinsic and the indiscriminately pro people score the same. They're both high. The extrinsic and the indiscriminately anti-people score low. And I think I can separate them out. I can tell who's falsifying and who's denying experience. So here's what I do. I interview people, and there's a neat thing that um, I got from a friend of mine, actually, from the CIA. But they're very sophisticated voice stress analyzers. And you all know what, what, what it is when people are talking, and they're claiming to you they're not nervous or they're not upset, but their voice is cracking, and they're standing there shaking, and they're leaving a little puddle. And you begin to think, I, I, I think you're nervous, right? And if you're nervous, there's a reason for that. So we interview people extensively about their mystical experiences based upon these four categories. And here's the summary of what we find. People who are intrinsic or able to explore and struggle with their experience and know, show no sign of voice distress. But people who are indiscriminately pro describe experiences, stumble, it doesn't sound authentic, and they show immense stress. So what I think they are is trying to present a religious life that in fact they don't have in a more flamboyant sense they're simply lying but the most interesting are the extrinsic and indiscriminately anti people because the extrinsic people when talking about mystical experiences i don't know what you're talking about have anything like that it doesn't interest me you know and they don't show any stress there are people who simply have no deep spiritual life, and that's just fine. But there's a group of indiscriminately anti-people who are amazingly interesting because they deny that they've had any mystical experiences, they're struggling, and they show immense signs of stress. And those are the people that get us to the Good Friday experience. Because those are the people that are saying, religion's all bunk, Mystical experience is all the bone, but they're struggling with what I think are experiences that they're having and trying to put down. So what happens with the Good Friday experience? There was, in the 60s, an interesting phenomenon. Um, you might put it with um, the drug revolution, the hippies, uh, in a book by Harvey Cost, it's called Turning East, the so-called psychedelic revolution. And the psychedelic re revolution started as an interesting religious movement with individuals taking certain types of drugs, particularly LSD and as we'll see with the Harvard studies, psilocybin, and having two kinds of possible experiences. A sense of an alteration in the way they experienced the world, 
when taking this very minor drug substance. And if that were all there was to it, it wouldn't be interesting. It would simply be another drug-induced or facilitated state. But William James, in a brilliant move in the varieties, wrote what for many is a definitive chapter, arguing against what he called medical materialism, arguing that you could not refute an experience by identifying what you think are the proximate conditions that facilitate it. So James said, for instance, if mad people have mystical experiences, it doesn't mean they're not mad, but it doesn't tell you anything about the value and ontological validity of the experience. You judge the experience, not by its origins, but by its roots. So as the drug revolution reached the streets, um, the best example history that is written by uh, a guy named Stevens called Storm in Heaven. There was a turn of East, people having these experiences and, and wondering what they were about. And the psychologist said, you know, you're going mad, these are psychomimetic drugs, all that kind of stuff. And the churches opposed that as artificially elicited states of consciousness. So the drug people turned East. They turned to explore Hinduism and Buddhism, where all of these experiences that were triggered by drugs were common, and they were not drug dependent. So what happened was there was a man named Timothy Leary, whose reputation has been deservedly tarnished. But you need to go back and read the literatures of the 60s, because Timothy Leary was recruited to Harvard University to solve a problem. And that is the problem that he was to solve was the failure of psychotherapy. How did people get into these drugs and unable to get out of them. And Timothy Leary said what they need to do is be able to reframe the world, to see the world differently. But how do you see the world differently? How can you do it? And he said, here's what we need to do. We need to use these substances. Not because they're interesting biochemically, although they are. Not because they alter your brain, although they do. But because they seem to be useful for some people to alter the way they see the world. And when they see the world in this altered way, they are confronting something that has ontological validity. They get out of their rut. So here's what he did. He worked with a brilliant student named Panky. And Panky had a medical degree, had a theology degree, and was Timothy Leary's best PhD student. And they designed this experiment, which now is being replicated at John Hopkins University. I'm going to give you the experiment, I'm going to give you the replication, and we'll end. The experiment was very simple. He said, let's take people who are in a rush, who, who have these profound experiences that um, they recognize and let's compare them to people who don't. Now, we know the people that have these profound experiences because they're found within the great faith traditions, these people that report and indeed have mystical experiences. But what about people who don't? So he said, let's take people who don't have those experiences but should. So he designed an experiment called the Good Friday Experiment, which was his PhD thesis. It's also called the Miracle of Mars Chapel, even it's called many things. But here's what he did. He decided to take Protestant seminary students. These are people who are going to seminary, so have strong, profound religious beliefs about the world that we could debate forever. So you know, again, if people are debating theological beliefs, religious beliefs, you have errors, you walk aside. But he said, what if we could do something? Why don't we could take them to a significant event? So he said, let's do something. Let's design this experiment where they go and hear a sermon on Good Friday. So these are Protestant seminary students, right? They're going to hear a sermon 
on Good Friday, and, they, and the, the, the person preaching the sermon was a brilliant man, the same man who taught Martin Luther King to preach. So that they're going to hear this profoundly moving sermon dealing with the death and resurrection. Right? And here's what we're going to do. Half of them are going to be given suicide, essentially for all purposes, LSD. The other half are going to be given a double blind control. And the people who are given psilocybin will be assigned two guys. One who doesn't take the psilocybin, and the other who does take psilocybin. And all they're going to do is listen to a good Friday sermon. And then we're going to see what happens. All kinds of problems with the study, but let me summarize it real quick. What happens is the people who took psilocybin had the most profoundly moving experience of their lives. They also, on measures akin to my mysticism scale, scored extremely high. Those who didn't take mysticism, the mysticism, uh, the psilocybin, and didn't uh, score high on the mysticism kind of measures, either didn't have a significant experience, simply had a meaningful experience, because after all, it's about the resurrection of God, Jesus, their, their beliefs. Or they were totally distraught and disorganized. They could not frame it effectively. So the follow-up of that study was done 20 years later. They took the people who had this profoundly moving experience, were able to reassess them, and these were people who had stayed within their faith, developed their faith, Precisely because the content of their beliefs now matched the way they experienced and knew the world to be. So now there's a man that's doing something amazingly profound, I'll make it short, at John Hopkins University. His name is Griffith, and he's funded by the Council on Spiritual Practices. And what he's trying to do, and he has the studies now published, is to use psilocybin in order to take people who are lacking in their faith and give them experiences that renew their faith by eliciting and facilitating mystical states of consciousness. Now Griffith is important for two reasons, and I'll quit. He's a world authority on two drugs, mysticism, okay, with psilocybin, and caffeine. Now, the reason I like to mention caffeine is most of you know about caffeine, right? And you know that caffeine is a drug, but there are no drug-specific effects that you would attribute to caffeine that would invalidate any kind of experience. If I said to you, I went to Starbucks and got some long Valdez here and then saw God, what would you say? <coughs> I'm glad you saw God, whatever that means and stuff, but I don't think it was caused by the coffee. And most of you use coffee like it's a generalized beta enhancer, right? You, you use it because it makes you awake. And then what you do when you're awake has nothing to do with the drug, right? But if you drink coffee and you study chemistry and get an A on your chemistry exam, I shouldn't say I need a urine test. Right? And then I said, I'm going to fail you because you have like drug enhanced performance. You say, no, I took caffeine and then I studied hard and I did well. Somebody else is really dumb says, well, I won't study chemistry, I'll just drink caffeine. You said, that won't work. Right? So here's what we know from the Good Friday experiment. Mystical states are universal. They are embedded in all the great faith traditions. The language of the faith traditions is not restricted to that, but it exists because that experience exists. And that experience can be facilitated by a wide variety of means. I've done it with setting, setting incongruities, sensory isolation, psilocybin, prayer, meditation. It doesn't make any difference. But when that experience occurs, it is the fuel that gives the lived dimension to a faith tradition, which is inevitably linked back, not to simple beliefs that run dry, but to experiences that are embedded in your very nature that you are sure to have, if you like, in my phrase, a sense of ontological validity 
because they elicit in you a sense of ontological wonder that occurs when the self dissolves and is merged into a greater reality it is made aware of. Thank you.